So uh, we'll start by going over what I think are some of the most exciting developments uh, in the field of single cell genomics over the past year. Um, this is, of course, an incredibly fast-paced field, um, both in experimental and computational methods development. Uh, and so I'm going to highlight 10 uh, new areas, five computational and five experimental that I think uh, you should be aware of. And, and the goal isn't to go sort of into too much detail uh, for any individual method, but really to give you the intuition behind each one, tell you why I'm excited about it, and maybe even uh, convince you to read the, the article or, or give it a try uh, in your own work. Uh, so everything on this list is something that we think you should be aware of, even if it's in preprint form. And in fact, we've actually made a particular effort to prioritize highlighting preprints because often those are papers that you might not have seen yet, um, but might be extremely valuable for your work. Um, so as I go through these, you know, we'll make a full list of all of the references that I mentioned, and we'll publish them on this website uh, after the talk is done. Um, but my PhD student, Andrew Butler, will also be sending out a variety of links um, to these references on the YouTube chat uh, kind of as I go along, as I go along. So you can you can follow there as well. So let's get started with one development that I'm particularly excited about uh, this year, which is really an explosion of papers that do single cell uh, cut and tag. Now, if you don't know what cut and tag is, uh, think of it just like a tag seek, um, but with one really important difference. So a tag seek uses a TN5 transposase um, to label regions of open chromatin. So you can measure chromatin accessibility, for example, in single cells. Now in cut and tag, that same TN5 protein is fused to protein A, which likes to bind antibodies. So if you stain your cells with an antibody, for example, against K4ME3, the TN5 transposome will be directed to DNA regions that are bound by K4ME3. Uh, so it's sort of like a targeted transposition. You target the TN5 towards particularly DNA bound regions that you're interested in. And just like with ChIP-seq, you can do this with a diverse set of proteins that bind DNA, just depending on what antibody you use. So you can use H3K4ME3, H3K27, ME3, K27 acetylation. It's basically an extremely efficient and high quality version of single cell chip seek, which is something that we as a community have been waiting for for a very long time. Um, so cut and tag was developed by the Hennikoff lab and single cell cut and tag was demonstrated over the last year on the 10X genomics platform, um, both by Steve Hennikoff's group, but also uh, Gonzalo Castello Branco. Um, the, the two groups um, describe this technology in a diverse set of systems ranging from glioblastoma tumors um, to the blood, uh, to the mouse brain, um, which I'm showing data from here. Uh, it's, it's really quite exciting. Um, and it, because it's just like a tax seek, uh, it, it really is just a slight modification um, to a standard 10X single cell attack seek experiment. In fact, it uses the 10X single cell attack seek kit if you want to, uh, which is really accessible and, and fantastic. So if you've been doing a tax seek, why switch to cut and tag, right? Well, a tax seek is fantastic for studying gene regulation, but the data is sort of binary. So a region can be either open and accessible uh, or closed. But if you have histone modification data, you can leverage the histone code to label much more granular chromatin states. Um, so not only open and closed regions, but you can annotate these as promoters, repressors, enhancers, poise regions, active regions, pause regions, or even regions of heterochromatin. Um, so it's a much more granular way of describing the function of a segment of DNA. And you can see here in this, in this plot, clear examples of regions that serve as cell type specific promoters, cell type specific enhancers, or cell type specific repressors. And, and this type of insight would be challenging to achieve just with a tax seek um, accessibility data alone. So that's really exciting, uh, but there are some challenges. The first is that the data from single cell cut and tag is sparse. So you're probably going to get less clusters if you sort of cluster your cut and tag data than you would if you do single cell RNA seq. And the second challenge is the data is harder to interpret and certainly harder to integrate. So how do you match the clusters you would get from a cut and tag like experiment for K4ME3 with clusters that you get from sort of a K9ME3 heterochromatin experiment? That's a pretty difficult challenge. And the answer appeared sort of magically uh, last month from Bing Ren's group in the form of a new method called paired tag. Uh, and it's actually an extension of a method we talked about last year from Bing Ren's lab called paired seek which measures attack seq profiles and RNA seq in the same nucleus. But now it's modified that instead of measuring attack seq, you measure cut and tag. So you can measure the transcriptome and cut and tag profiles simultaneously in the same cell, in the same assay. Uh, it uses combinatorial indexing, so it's not a 10x uh, uh, technology, but it's still very high throughput and accessible. And the multimodal data is really transformative because you have your cut and tag profiles from single cells. But you can also use your RNA data for clustering to easily define cell states. 
And it also means that you can do many histone marks across different experiments. So you can do you know, five or six different histone marks in six different experiments. But in each independent experiment, you measure a different histone modification, but you also measure the transcriptome. And because you always are measuring gene expression, that makes it easy to integrate these different experiments together. And that's exactly what the authors did. They measured about 90,000 nuclei split across five different histone marks and chromatin accessibility. And then they use their RNA data to define cellular states. You can see they get very beautiful clustering uh, across these experiments. And then for each of the 22 different cell types they define, they get aggregate histone modification profiles. And they can use these profiles to define complex chromatin states, see how they change across cell types, and link them to the expression of downstream genes. So for example, for the PDGFRA locus, you can see that the entire locus is sort of coded in repressive K27ME3 in almost every cell type, except for one cell type where it's highly active, and that's the oligodendrocyte precursors where this gene um, is highly expressed. Uh, so if you're interested in this, please stay tuned until this afternoon. Uh, Bingji Zhang is going to give a deeper overview of cut and tag methods in some of these papers and highlight some new data and key considerations that you should keep in mind if you want to apply these approaches. Um, but we do think they're going to have substantial impact in the field, really complementing um, attack seek to understand how the regulatory landscape changes during development. Okay, so speaking of studying development, let's switch to a new set of computational methods that build upon previous advances. So many of you are familiar with pioneering methods like Wanderlust or Monocle um, for identifying trajectories in single cell data. These methods assume that cells take a parsimonious or smooth path through molecular space as they transition, and, and obviously learning these paths is an amazing opportunity for studying development. But we have to remember that when we do pseudotimer trajectory analysis, we don't actually know what direction the trajectories go in. Um, and of course, each trajectory doesn't measure the real path of any individual cell or lineage. It's just a computational inference. Um, so a few years ago, Sten Linerson and, and Peter Karchenko came up with a really brilliant idea to use the ratio of spliced and unspliced reads to infer whether a cell is increasing or decreasing production of any given gene. And this is called RNA velocity. And basically, it can be used to infer directionality across a trajectory and predict a cell's future fate. So that it's an, it's an amazing approach, but the estimates and quantifications of RNA velocity are noisy, um, even with Fabian Theis's group's beautiful SE Velo package, which improves the quantifications. So there are two sort of computationally uh, complementary approaches for learning um, developmental fates, um, trajectory inference and RNA velocity. And it was only a matter of time before these two methods were combined. And it's not surprising that this combined method actually comes from Donna Pear and Fabian Weiss. They, they named their method cell rank because it learns relationships between pairs of individual cells and then uses them, those pairwise relationships to estimate global dynamics. And it turns out this is exactly how the Google page rank algorithm also works. So basically for each cell, uh, the cell rank method computes an RNA velocity vector. So it can predict what a cell is going to turn into based on its RNA velocity in the future. Uh, the method also calculates a standard set of k-nearest neighbors based on the transcriptome. And a key step is the estimation of joint transition probabilities, which ask in a directed way, how likely is one cell on the data set going to transition into another? And to calculate this, they use a weighted mean of the velocity and the transcriptome data. So the transition probability from cell A to B will be high only if the velocity vector from A points towards B, and the two cells share a similar gene expression profile. So once they learn these transition probabilities, then they can learn, you know, the pancreas, for example, how likely is it that any individual cell is going to become, for example, an epsilon cell uh, or an alpha cell. You can really predict the future. And the, and the key is that these predictions are made using both gene expression patterns as well as RNA velocity. And that combination substantially improves accuracy. So we're very fortunate that Donna is going to give one of our keynote lectures uh, later today. I actually don't know if she'll specifically talk about this work, but of course she's a pioneer in this field. Uh, and I also wanted to briefly mention a second method called cell paths that also integrates expression and velocity information actually at the meta cell level. Um, so you can check that out on BioArchive if you're interested. So let's stay on the topic of integrating data types, but switch to multi-omic technologies where multiple molecular modalities are measured in the same cell. Um, so many of you are familiar with CiteSeq, which uses barcoded antibodies to quantify surface proteins alongside the transcriptome. Uh, and you're also likely familiar with the 10X multi-ohm kit um, or other technologies like ShareSeq and SnareSeq, 
where you can simultaneously measure a tax seek in transcriptomic profiles by transposing DNA and labeling RNA with the same cellular barcode. So these are really amazing advances for, for multiomic technologies. Together, they sort of span the central dogma by a two independent assays. Uh, and so it seems like it should just be kind of easy to combine them, right? Well, sort of, except for the fact that most technologies that profile a tax seek, including the 10X multiome kit, work on isolated nuclei. So obviously, if you remove the cell membrane to extract nuclei, you're not going to be able to profile surface proteins. Um, so that's a pretty significant technical hurdle. And actually, there are a few groups that have worked out how to solve this. And it started with Caleb Leroux and Leif Ludwig, who wanted to do a tax seek on permeabilized cells. Um, and they actually wanted to do this so they could get more mitochondrial reads in their ataxic data for lineage tracing. And what they found is that if they wanted to do ataxic on cells instead of nuclei, they really have to optimize the permeabilization conditions so that enzymes like the TN5 transposase could enter the nucleus and tag in chromatin, but they also couldn't dissolve the plasma membrane entirely. Uh, and so they tested a large variety of conditions and they found that removing or at least reducing digitonin in the buffer helped to maintain intact chromatin and ensure that a taxi reads did fall properly into peaks. But a few groups have been working to further optimize these protocols, including the Technology Innovation Lab here at the New York Genome Center and also the Allen Institute for Immunology. And together they found a few solutions for optimized permeabilization, including just using 0.1% NP40 or substituting very light digitonin for this detergent. Uh, multiple groups have also found that when working with PBMCs, depleting neutrophils can really help with the quality of single cell ataxy data. But the great thing is that with these optimized conditions, you can run a taxi while keeping your plasma membrane intact. And that means you can get protein measurements just like with SiteSeq, but when running the 10X single cell ataxy kit. Uh, and there were two preprints that came out last year, IcicleSeq and ASAPSeq that describe this and are shown below. But why detect two modalities when you can detect three? Uh, so even if you don't understand all the technical details, let's take a step back and remember it, by combining these optimized permeabilization conditions with the 10X multiome kit, you can measure chromatin, RNA, and protein spanning the entire central dogma, all in a single cell, all at the same time. And you can see that here in a preprint from the Allen Institute in the method called T-Seq. You get three different modalities. You can cluster your cells on each individual modality, or you can integrate the modalities together into a single representation using our weighted nearest neighbors approach. You can see quite beautifully the consistency across modalities and populations of cells that are defined by their chromatin state, their transcriptome, uh, and also their amino phenotype. Uh, a related approach was developed by the Technology Innovation Lab at the New York Genome Center, and for reasons you can probably guess, is called DogmaSeq. This particular extension is actually unpublished. It extends the ASAP Seq preprint, but you'll be able to read about it soon. And one of the lead authors on DogmaSeq is Caleb Leroux, who I mentioned earlier is particularly interested in recovering mitochondrial leads, reads view lineage tracing. And so this paper actually does a pretty detailed characterization of the best conditions to capture not just three, but four modalities, chromatin state, transcriptomic output, surface protein levels, and also mitochondrial variants for lineage tracing. Uh, so, you know, these are all early studies. Most of the data is aimed at proof of concept, um, but there's convincing data. And I think these approaches are really gonna help us to redefine molecular regulation at multiple different levels. This is particularly true as these technologies improve not only to quantify surface proteins, but also intracellular ones. And actually the next talk after me will be from Hadi Chung, who will introduce her new technology called InsightSeq, which generates paired measurements of intracellular proteins like transcription factors and cellular transcriptomes at the same time. Um, so if you're interested in this, stay tuned. And you can also explore, uh, explore the ASAPC preprint um, here, uh, which generates paired measurements of intracellular proteins in ataxic profiles. So now let's switch gears and move to a new computational paradigm that has become quite popular this year. And I'll introduce it with an analogy to the Human Genome Project and two very sort of different aspects of it. The first aspect involves constructing a genome reference. And this was, of course, an incredible effort to build the human genome reference. It spanned a decade, took incredible manpower and these sort of long, amazing, you know, 500 base pair or more reads. It was an incredibly challenging problem. And it makes sense that it was difficult because basically what you're trying to do with genome assembly is you're trying to put together a puzzle with lots of small pieces without knowing what the puzzle is supposed to look like. You're missing the finished picture on the box. 
And kind of building a single cell atlas is, is in many ways kind of the same problem. We don't know what the cell types are. We have to learn those by doing unsupervised clustering. And that process is laborious. There's lots of parameters. It needs manual interpretation to make sure the results are accurate biologically. But once we've done that, once we've had the picture on the box, it's a lot easier to interpret new data. So for genomes, we can run read mappers like black or bow tie, and we can map reads in milliseconds. This is routine, and you can do it on much lower quality data, like 25 base pair reads. So we want exactly the same thing for single cell genomics. Now, of course, to do this, we actually need to have a reference. We have to build a reference requires good data. You need to have a lot of cells with good technical metrics. You also have to do good computational analysis and carefully annotate your cells. That process can take weeks or even months, but for many human tissues, these data sets and references exist now, especially with consortia like the Human Cell Atlas and the Human Biomolecular Atlas Project, which are tasked with building them. And once these references are published, now we can map to them. So as a community, we wanna build tools that take a new data set and kind of work like BLAST. With the push of a button, we wanna be able to take a single cell data set, annotate the cells, project them into an existing visualization, identify differentially expressed genes, basically push bot button automated analysis that leverages the power of an existing reference. And I think this is exactly uh, where the field is heading. Um, as part of the Human Biomolecular Atlas project, my group has released Azimuth, which is a web tool that enables you to upload your data, hit a button, and Azimuth does the rest. It maps the cells, it annotates them, it visualizes them, and it finds the best gene expression markers, all with a single push of a button. So we currently have this available for four organs. Um, you can try it uh, yourself right now. If you'd like, just go to this link um, below. Um, it's a web tool, so you don't need any programming experience. There are demo data sets that are preloaded into the app. Um, and if you have your own, you can of course try those too. Uh, it can process tens of thousands of cells in less than a minute. And honestly, it's about as close as we've been able to get for making analytical tools for single cell analysis that not only return useful results and, and hopefully great results, but are also kind of fun, uh, easy, and interactive. We want this to feel like Blast, almost like a video game. Um, so please try this out uh, and stay tuned as we add more and more reference organs um, in the coming months. Uh, and actually this afternoon, Jason Jane will give an overview of some of the most recently developed uh, tools for, for reference mapping. He'll talk about azimuth and show you a demo, but he'll also talk about two additional methods that we really like, um, Symphony and SC Arches. Um, so we look forward to that. And in particular, we feel like reference mapping is, is really gonna change the way that we analyze single cell data. And it will be particularly useful for taking data sets from disease individuals, mapping them on onto healthy references uh, and seeing how they differ. Now that's of course gonna necessitate a new set of computational methods for comparative analysis of single cell data. And this year has been a big step forward for that. So for example, let's say that we have data sets from a healthy and an injured, injured individual, and we wanna understand how they differ. Uh, now, this would be easy if it was just bulk RNA-seq. We do just differential expression. But when we have single cell data, for each cell type, there could be a change in abundance, there could be a change in gene expression, or both. And that creates a couple of challenges. The first is, how do we prioritize which changes are actually important and significant, and which ones are just random fluctuations, especially if we, especially if we have biological or technical replicates? And the second is how do we deal with data sets that don't really fall into discrete clusters or cell types? So maybe it's a developing data set where the clustering is fuzzy, um, or maybe only part of a, of a cluster changes. So how can we detect differences then? Um, and these are big challenges. Uh, but there are cool methods to address them. So the first one I'll mention is from John Marioni's lab and it's called Milo. Uh, and it wants to identify changes in proportions of cells across conditions. But it also doesn't assume that you've defined a fixed clustering of your data. So what Milo does is it defines a set of representative neighborhoods on a KNN graph. So maybe each neighborhood consists of you know, 50 cells that are in a similar molecular state. And these neighborhoods are spread out sort of evenly over the data set um, and they can overlap. And then Milo looks at each neighborhood, say there are 50 cells, and it asks how many cells of the 50 are healthy and how many are diseased. So if it's 25, out of, if it's 25 and 25, it's probably not a significant shift. But if all 50 cells in the neighborhood are injured, then you've probably detected a region of the data set where there is a shift in cell state. Um, Milo uses a flexible generalized linear model framework. So it works well with a variety of, of experimental designs, especially if you have data from biological and technical replicates or multiple individuals, which you really should in your study. And you can see right away that there are regions of this graph that are different. So this region here, for example, this is very different between healthy and diseased tissue. You can see that difference even on the original UMAP plots. Um, but it's also interesting that only a sort of subpart of the cluster is changing 
Um, but still, Milo was able to pick this up, which is quite exciting. Um, there actually have been a few methods that have been published with sim similar goals. I'm listing a few of them here. Uh, I do want to highlight the Muscat package from Helena Crawwell, uh, Charlotte Senesson, and Mark Robison. Um, Muscat is focused on implementing tests not for differential uh, not, not for differential abundance, um, but for differential expression, um, and not just within a data set, but across data sets. So, for example, how do you do differential expression between beta cells from healthy and diseased individuals? based on single cell RNA-seq. So if you're interested in that type of question, um, we think Muscat is really required reading and really highlights key considerations and methods um, for experimental design and comparative analysis. Okay, so let's switch gears again uh, away from single cell analysis and, and onto spatial methods, which I'm sure that many of you are very interested in and which are evolving like crazy. Um, so a couple of years ago at this workshop, we highlighted the rise in spatial transcriptomic methods, and we highlighted the original ST method, which was became sort of 10x Visium. And there, glass slides are arrayed with oligo DT primers that capture polyadenylated RNA, but also have a unique spatial barcode. So this has driven, obviously, a lot of excitement in the community and, and yields beautiful data, but there is sort of a limit to how finely you can print these distinct oligos onto a slide. Uh, and as a result, each Visium spot has a, di a diameter of about 55 microns, which can house you know, 10 or more cells. So it's a little bit lower resolution than we'd like ideally. Uh, shortly after, our friends in the McCosco and Chen labs introduced SlideSeq, and they were able to improve their resolution by basically randomly packing really small 10 micron beads, like dropsy beads, um, onto a slide. Then they do solid sequencing in situ to figure out which barcode is located in which spatial location. So it's a really cool technology, but there is a trade-off that as you, as you have increased resolution and your voxels decrease in size, you also get less molecules per voxel. So you know, there's room for all these methods to improve, and that certainly happened this year. Starting with SlideSeq2, which was a follow-up manuscript from the McCosco and Chen labs, this featured a number of exciting advances, chief amongst them an increase in the number of detected molecules per spot by an order of magnitude. And as a result, if you match the same voxel size from 10x uh, Visium and slide C2, there is a significant boost in molecular sensitivity for slide C2. And if you look at any individual gene, this is, for example, in the mouse hippocampus, it, it really looks like an in situ, um, as you get from a high sensitivity assay. But of course, it's transcriptome wide. Um, so at 10 micron resolution, it's really sort of near cellular resolution with high sensitivity, um, and that is a huge step forward. But that's just one example of many remarkable steps in spatial transcriptomics this year, where there have been a suite of new methods that have pioneered very clever ways to array and index oligos with the spatial barcode on a capture surface with very high resolution. Um, so Rong Fan's lab, for example, uses a microfluidic device to deposit oligos at 10 micron resolution onto a capture surface, which is very cool. But the most recent developments actually extend resolution to subcellular levels, less than one micron, like a microscope pixel. And they do this by basically seeding random oligos onto a surface using clonal amplification to create clusters, or they can call polonies or nanoballs on the surface, kind of like they're creating their own alumina flow cell. And in fact, they can put that capture surface directly on an alumina machine or a BGI machine, and that tells them the spatial location for each spatial location, which oligo is there. And you can generate just incredible data sets. So just to take a step back for a second, even if you don't understand any of those technical details, these technologies offer the ability to do transcriptome-wide RNA-seq, but with a spatial resolution of less than a micron. To me, that's just absolutely magical. Um, and for sure, these submicron resolution approaches are probably not technologies you can run in your lab today. Um, but it does point to a very exciting future that completely changes the way that we do spatial analysis, not just looking under the microscope, but really looking under the sequencer. These are just extraordinarily plots that are generated by these technologies across many different systems. Um, and the field is really developing faster than we could have possibly expected. Um, and that's one reason we're fortunate today um, to have a keynote um, from Fei Chen at the Broad, who has really been a true pioneer um, in this new frontier of spatial and temporal genomics. Um, so please do stick around for his talk. Uh, now, of course, we have an exciting new suite of, ex of technologies for spatial analysis. So we need new analytical strategies as well, particularly to integrate these data with single cell RNA-seq uh, measurements. So the idea is that each of these spatial transcriptomic voxels, especially if you're using something like Visium, represents a mixture of single cells. And therefore, each voxel's profile is basically its own bulk RNA-seq experiment. 
So it's sort of a natural computational problem to try to deconvolute these voxels to estimate the cells that were present in each one. Now, this does require an existing single cell RNA-seq data set, but there are plenty of those, as we discussed. And it seems like this should be an easy problem because there are plenty of deconvolution approaches for RNA-seq. But those methods actually perform poorly in this context. And, and the reason is that there are batch effects between the single cell RNA-seq technology and the spatial technology. And so you need to design a deconvolution approach that can not only learn these batch effects, but can also allow them to be cell type specific, which they, which they truly are. So you need really good statistics and really good models. But luckily, our field has some very good statisticians. And so two methods that came up in the last year uh, represent computational work led by Rafael Rosari's group. They have a method called robust cell type decomposition. Um, and one from Ali Stiegel and Omar Bayraktar named cell to location. Uh, and you know, what these methods do is they take a single cell RNA-seq data set and a spatial transcriptomics data set from the same tissue. And then for each spatial voxel, they predict the cell types that were present there. Now, I'm not going to go over the technical details behind how these methods work, but they really do work beautifully, either on big voxels that contain many cells, like the 10x Visium, um, or for voxels that likely contain just one cell, um, like in slide C2. So these methods offer really promising solutions to an absolutely essential computational problem, because of course, when we do spatial transcriptomics, we're not actually measuring single cell profiles with these technologies, we're measuring voxels. But with these computational approaches, we can still interpret our data in the context of single cell types, which is a natural level of resolution to study spatial biology. And that's a major advance. Uh, and along these lines, I'm really excited for Sheila's talk this afternoon. She's done phenomenal work um, integrating spatial and sequencing data sets in the mouse embryo. Um, so please stay tuned for that. Now for our last experimental advance, we'll switch back to single cell analysis and in particular, the ability to genetically perturb single cells. So in the last year, there have been an incredible set of ex extensions to the original perturb-seq technology. And I'm gonna group them together into the term like perturb-seq plus, okay? So just as a reminder, the idea behind perturb-seq is to infect cells with a pool of guide RNAs so that each cell receives a different perturbation. Then when you do your single cell RNA-seq experiment, you can also sequence the specific guide RNA that each cell received. It's a wonderful approach to do multiplexed in vitro studies of gene function, and you can really measure any molecular phenotype that's encoded in the transcriptome. It's a pioneering approach to reconstruct gene regulatory networks and was the basis of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back publications in cell between the Regev, Weissman, and the Meat Labs in 2016. But what's been really fun about the last year is how many ways this idea has actually been extended. Um, so one extension is to move these experiments outside of cell culture and into a live animal. Um, so Zin Jen at the Broad uh, did this with in vivo perturb seek. She wanted to study the effect of knocking out candidate genes for neurodevelopmental disorders. So she infected embryonic neural progenitors with a pool of guide RNAs and then collected the progeny from labeled cells from the fully developed brain and sequenced them. Uh, but the developed cells at, at you know, day P7, they don't re resemble a homogeneous cell culture system. They represent a wide mix of different cell types. And that means that when you run perturb-seq, not only can you study the effect of multiple perturbations, but you can study the effect of multiple perturbations in multiple different cell types, all in vivo. So for example, she found that perturbing genes whose mutations are tightly linked to autism, like CHD8, had clear molecular phenotypes but those phenotypes could only be observed in a subset of cells. And that's really a fantastic insight, not only for identifying which genes contribute to disease, but the types of cells that they act through. And I won't say more because we're very fortunate to have Zinn give a talk on her work uh, later this afternoon. Another exciting advance is the ability to perturb genes, but then to measure the impact on more than just the transcriptome. So two studies came out earlier this year that performed perturb-seq, but with a multimodal readout. So the study from my lab used the ExciteSeq technology, which directly captures um, and sequences the guide RNA, and then measures surface proteins and transcriptomes alongside of it. Um, a co-published study from Aviv Regev and, and Ben Izar used the CropSeq technology, but also sequenced guide RNAs, transcriptomes, and surface protein levels in single cells. Now, both papers were interested in the regulation of immune checkpoint proteins like PDL1, and the multimodal readout was really transformative for a couple reasons. First, for example, when we observe changes in pd one protein level, uh, because we were measuring both RNA and protein, we could also see if there were transcriptional changes as well. And that allowed us to distinguish between transcriptional and post-transcriptional modes of regulation, which otherwise is extremely difficult to do. 
In addition, both studies linked changes in the expression of surface protein levels to the activation of multiple different transcriptomic gene modules or pathways, since there's transcriptomic data measured in every cell, and that was extremely valuable for building these regulatory networks and connecting them to protein expression. Um, so to us, these were exciting stories, especially as the size of a single cell experiments continues to grow and we can perturb even more and more genes. So those are a couple examples, but in fact, there's a whole suite of new methods that build off the, the perturb-seq paradigm this year. This includes the ability to do a tax-seq instead of RNA-seq after perturbation to see how genetic perturbations affect chromosome accessibility. There are new methods to perturb multiple genes simultaneously instead of just one at a time, um, and then to profile millions of cells and potentially do genome-wide screens. We have an incredible series of talks throughout the day focused on these methods. I'm sure many of us are looking forward to them, especially from Paul Datlinger, Zin Jin, and Sarah Pierce, who will talk about new technologies and biological discoveries that they've made. Uh, and then Effie Papalexi will overview some of the analytical methods that are used for these data types. All right, so the last highlight for this year spans both computational and experimental work and reflects a truly remarkable effort between hundreds, if not thousands of scientists to understand the cellular origins of COVID-19 uh, with single cell sequencing methods. And the way that different groups and different consortia have all come together to share data openly, pool resources and ask questions together is, is just inspirational. And it's led to real and concrete discoveries that have modified our understanding of this disease. And I can't possibly go through everything, but I do wanna highlight a couple of key results that really came together as part of this community effort. If you think back a year ago, we actually knew very little about SARS-CoV-2, but we did know that viral entry into cells was dependent on the host expression of a couple of factors, including ACE2 and TMPRSS2. And that immediately raised the question, what cell types and in what tissues are these genes co-expressed? And that was a perfect question for the human cell atlas. So this paper from the Human Cell Atlas Biological uh, Lung Network did a meta-analysis of 31 lung and airway data sets to ask precisely that question. So who expresses these genes? They found that multiple lung epithelial cells, such as type 2 pneumocytes, uh, were co-expressors, and that wasn't too surprising. Uh, but they also found double positive cells in the nasal airways, particularly goblet secretory cells, which could, could explain another route of viral entry. Um, as well as colonic enterocytes, which was less expected, but could explain clinical phenotypes associated with early stages of infection. Moreover, when these genes were present, they were often accompanied by additional proteases and cathepsins that can govern the viral life cycle. So it really was a case where we needed to know urgently as a community where these genes that played a functional role were expressed uh, and the community really stepped up. Um, complementary data has also revealed key insights into how these genes are regulated. For example, the Shalik lab showed that ACE2 is a downstream target of interferon, suggesting that this may enhance the virus's ability to infect during an initial immune response. And the HCA lung network also found that ACE2 showed clear evidence of ex increased expression with age in men uh, and in smokers as well, all consistent with disparities in COVID-19 phenotypes. Um, it's really important to note that no one study would have had a sufficient number of cells or donors to make these findings, and the community-based meta-analysis was essential. On a separate front, multiple groups have been able to draw blood from patients at different stages of COVID-19 disease severity and perform single-cell profiling. And this is really an incredible opportunity to understand the immune system of patients and how it's perturbed by infection and how cells change over the course of disease progression. So I can't possibly list all the papers that have looked at this, but the results have actually been strikingly consistent. Multiple studies have found that myeloid cells and monocytes in particular become dysregulated during severe COVID-19. These cells express a strong interferon and stress response. They lose the expression of key markers like HLA-DR, and they rapidly shift their state. Interestingly, this phenotype is really only observed in severe cases and doesn't necessarily characterize mild disease. There are also cells whose abundance changes, changes dramatically with infection. In particular, a few studies have identified a population of developing neutrophils that sharply increases in abundance during disease progression and is a striking predictor actually of mortality. And there are also clear decreases in the abundance of particular effector populations like mucosal associated invariant T cells, presumably as they migrate to tissues like the lung to fight infection. So this is only a minor sampling of the work that's been done, but, but just to take a step back, you know, five years ago when I started my lab and we started this workshop, single cell technology was mostly being done by just a few select set of people. It was kind of a technically driven field. Uh, and to see this year how it's matured to the point where entire groups can come together 
to try to make a meaningful contribution to a global health crisis is, is really incredible. The community that's come up around this field has been open, it's been inclusive, it's been collaborative, it, it's really inspiring. I'm very proud to be a part of that community and I'm very excited to hear talks um, from some amazing people uh, in it today. So that's a lot to cover in 40 minutes, but that's the list of the things we were excited about in 2020. Um, as I mentioned, we'll release, a full list, uh, we'll release a full list of these references and a video of this talk on this website in the future. Uh, I really want to thank our incredible sponsors today for their support in helping us put this together, uh, in particular NHGRI, uh, which funds many education and outreach opportunities for my lab as part of their SEGS program, uh, and also the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and New York University. Thanks so much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Rahul, for a very interesting talk and introduction. Um, I think we have time for maybe one question. So I see one here from uh, Juan Quintana. He asks, can we use cell rank or RNA velocity to infer the direct directionality between conditions? So uh, he says, for example, naive to infected. That's a great question. So you're asking, can we kind of use, instead of looking at directionality within a data set, can we sort of compare directionally across data sets? Uh, you know, it's, it's actually something I haven't thought of. Um, and I, I, I think in, in some ways, if you, if you mixed those, those uh, two conditions together, you would have one data set. Uh, I, I think you very likely could. I think you would be able to see over the course of any way that a cell transitions, for example, if it's transitioning over the course of infection, um, you should be able to record those changes through RNA velocity. So both developmental transitions and sort of transitions that are driven by the environment uh, are things you should be able to, to infer fates for um, through things like RNA velocity and cell rank. Okay, great, thanks.